All right, it is our final segment this morning with uh, malpractice attorney Clint Kelly. As I said, he's handling a lot of cases. One of them that our own Jennifer Krause has done several stories on, as you'll recall, back a ways. There was a situation at a nursing facility during the COVID outbreak and uh, bad results for a lot of families. Mm -hmm. um, you're suing, it's kind of like, would you say a class action, a consolidated Call suit? Call it a mass tort. Mass tort. Mass tort. Where do we stand on that? All right. For those who don't know, Gallatin Center for Rehabilitation and Healing had a massive COVID outbreak, the largest one in Tennessee. They had the most positive cases of all the other nursing homes combined. They had the most fatalities of all the other nursing homes in Tennessee combined. So we sued the nursing home and we represent 25 residents and their families. 14 of them died. The rest survived the COVID, but had different issues as a result, long haul, other sure. types of symptoms. So we spent months getting records from the nursing home to establish what we think are the three key points of the case. Poor screening at the entrance of the facilities to keep out people who might be sick, poor use of PPE, you know, personal protective equipment, and poor preparation. They knew COVID was coming, their corporate headquarters are in New Jersey. They knew it was coming from the Northeast, but did not act appropriately to prevent a massive outbreak. Which, by the way, there's another nursing home a mile and a half away from the Gallatin facility that did not have an outbreak. All right. So clearly, right. standard of care was an issue here. So, so you've filed notice and sued sue the nursing home. Sue. And what the judge has done is the judge has consolidated all of these cases for the purposes of taking depositions. So we don't have to repeat depositions in every one of those 25 cases. Well, this means that all the family members, the clients, can all attend these depositions. And we've got a group now of about 40, 45 people who can now attend every one of the depositions. And what we're gonna do on February the 6th is we're gonna start taking depositions of the corporate representatives of the nursing home. We're gonna do it at a Holiday Inn. Explain to folks what a deposition is. Deposition is when somebody testifies, you know, you raise your right hand and you testify under oath in like a, a, a conference room. Uh, it's on video, little court reporters there t -t 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 type it up and you ask questions. It just doesn't happen in a courtroom, it happens privately This is creating a record and it's under oath so it can come up later and you're not to lie, you're to be truthful. That is correct. But what's gonna be different about these depositions, it's going to look more like a congressional hearing because it's going to be in a large meeting room, okay? You're going to have 40 plus people in attendance. We'll have a projector and a screen so that the witness's face that's shown on camera will appear up on the projector screen so everyone that's in the audience can watch what this person's saying. You, know, mm -hmm. you see that in congressional sure. hearings. So everyone will get an opportunity to see what the testimony is. They won't be interacting with these representatives. No. It'll be you asking questions. The representatives will have attorneys there with them. That's correct. But they're gonna sit and what, what kind of questions do you ask them under these circumstances? Well, I told you one of the elements of our claim is it was poor screening. Okay. And Jennifer reported on this in the news story. We have the screening documents. By the way, they didn't keep all of them. That's mm -hmm. a separate story. But the screening documents show that either temperatures weren't taken or when temperatures were taken, they were wrong. I mean, some instances people had recorded temperatures of 72 degrees. That's impossible. Nick. Right. You'd be dead. Yeah. Uh, people reported that they had symptoms consistent with COVID but were allowed entry. Some people didn't answer any questions as to whether or not they had symptoms consistent with COVID. And not a single solitary staff member was denied entry to the facility up until the date that there was the massive evacuation on March 25th. Mm -hmm. So you have this grand scheming protocol, but you don't follow it. Right. And that's our theory is they let people into the facility that they shouldn't have let in, and that's how COVID spread throughout the facility. So that's one of the major So your question will be, into. sir, mm -hmm. are you aware of the screening and the failure of this? Or what, how do you phrase it? I'm just curious. What, yeah, what I'd say, sir, here's the screening form right here, and I see that the temperature is 72 degrees. How do you let a, how do you let a staff member in with a temperature 72 degrees? or no temperature at all recorded there. Or Mr. Yeah. So-and-so, how'd you train the screeners? What were they required to do? How were they supposed to do their job? How would a reasonable screener let in somebody who reported here that they had a temperature? Or who reported here that they were having cough and sneezing consistent with COVID? Or how would you let somebody in who didn't answer any of the questions? 
Mm -hmm. And one of the people who didn't answer the questions, Nick, was the administrator. Mm -hmm. That's just inexcusable. It's sloppy. How are they going to answer this? They'll say it was COVID, Mr. Kelly. It was a hectic time. It was busy. We had all kinds of people coming in and out of that facility to take care of our residents, and we were treating the residents. We weren't treating the records. And then you're going to say, <laughs> and then I'm why is it that you're the only place that had levels like this? I mean, you can give the standard of that care. Is, that is the question. Nick. Yeah. That is the ultimate question. How is it you're the only facility that had a massive outbreak like this when none of the others in Tennessee did? That's the response. So you say we're too busy treating our patients. The others aren't so, busy? Yeah. So yeah. We, you weren't busy enough protecting your residents. That's the problem. Yeah. And you weren't following your own protocols. Your protocols are no good if you're not going to follow them. It, it sounds to me, from the outside looking in, haven't heard the whole thing. It's just mm -hmm. they weren't taking it seriously. And then, you know, they, I don't know what the reason was. It just sounds like they had protocol, and whoever was in charge or whatever, if you said the administrator, they simply didn't think it was a big deal. I, I don't think know. That's, maybe I maybe think that's a main, a major factor. Because if they had taken it seriously. Mm -hmm. First of all, the screening would have been done appropriately. People would have been denied entry as they should have. These forms would be completed, and everybody would be wearing masks mm -hmm. in the facility. That's something I don't know if you know about. People didn't start wearing masks when taking care of residents mm -hmm. until March 23rd. Yeah. Think about that, Nick. Yeah. We knew what was going on in New England with all of these nursing homes with these massive outbreaks there. And, you know, it's one thing to require a mask with people when they're outside, okay, yeah. doing things. We can all question how effective that is. But when you're in an enclosed room, and these rooms, by the way, in the nursing homes are small, and you're coming as close to a, a resident as I am to you, there's not much place for the air molecules to go except mm -hmm. straight ahead. Right. To not have these staff members wearing masks every time they're treating residents is outrageous. This case, could it settle? Could it go to trial? I mean, the deposition, by the way, is not just a chance for you to gather information. Mm -hmm. Do you also get to give these executives and their attorneys kind of a peek at what you have? Yes. And so they're going to be like afterward, wow, that didn't go well. All right. Um, I don't think we want to go to trial with this guy. Or they may say, well... I think we make some good arguments in court based on what we've heard. Is that kind of, it's a two-way street, right? It is a two-way street, and I don't know what they're going to yeah. do. What I know that I'm going to do is these families want answers. Mm -hmm. Just like Ms. Stark does with Centennial Medical Center about her husband catching on fire, these families want to know how did this virus take off in this facility and kill so many residents? Mm -hmm. Why did it happen? How could it have been prevented? They, they're they itching to know this, and they're going to find out. That's my commitment to them. Mm -hmm. We're not settling anything until we figure out what happened. This mm -hmm. facility is still in operation in Gallatin. Mm -hmm. Some of the sta same staff are still there. What if we have another pandemic, mm -hmm. God forbid, or another outbreak of some kind? Is this facility, has it learned its lessons? Is it uniquely situated to prevent another massive outbreak? I don't know the answer to that, but I will when mm -hmm. we finish with these depositions. The only way facilities like this or in any of this, you've always said, gets their attention is getting a judgment against them, money. Ultimately, that's what, <laughs> get, it, there's got to be some kind of payment, something that hurts. Then they say, gee, we don't want to lose that money again if they don't care about it's, the... It's accountability. Now. Yeah. It's all accountability. When people scratch a check, mm -hmm. if you will, that's accountability. Exactly. Uh, when they have to testify and explain why something happened, that's accountability. And accountability matters. If we don't have accountability, mm -hmm. then these things continue to happen all the time. Right. That's All right. Clint, let's remind folks mm -hmm. how they can reach you again. If you have a case or something, don't wait a year to call. Poor Donnie's friend did, and she would have yeah. had a case. Um, that number, I can never remember it. It's such a hard number to remember. <laughs> it's 615 million, and that's the reason why it is that number. It's easier to remember. 615 million. Or you can reach us at kellyfirm.net. I've got staff at the uh, office that will take information in the phone call that's necessary for me to make an appraisal of your claim. I will consult with an expert. If you have a claim, I will take your case. If you don't, I will write you a letter or contact you and tell you why you don't. And That's one of the things that, that I'm different from other lawyers here in Middle Tennessee. I will actually tell you. Yeah. 
why you don't have a client. Which is good, because people sometimes are denied. I have friends call me all the time, people that follow me on Facebook, and they say, well, no one's taking my case, and I don't know why. It's good that you do that. Yeah. Clint, thank you. Great good to see you, my friend. Yeah. If I don't see you again, 2023. Happy you got That's it. Right. We'll see you next year. All thank right? you. I'll be back with a programming note right after this. Stay with us. <laughs>